Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my talk about probabilistic data structures in Go. Uh, I am Dylan Meers and I am a tech lead at Deploy.ai where we build a machine learning deployment platform using mainly Go. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Medium, etc. with the handle at Dylan Meers. If I'm on there, that's usually my handle. Um, so yeah. Something that we will talk about today are the Bloom filters and the Cuckoo filters. And there are two types of probabilistic data structures. So what this means, we will get into uh, in a bit more detail soon, of course. Um, but just for now, no, there's actually a lot more. These are just the two that I, that I picked out. But first, let's kind of set a problem statement that we will carry with us along the entire talk. So let's imagine that you're building an application and you want to store unique usernames. So the requirements are that each username can only appear once in your code, and you should be able to test if the username is taken or not. So those are the two basic operations you want to do. If you would do this completely in memory in Go, you would probably create a set using a map. So you have a map of a certain key to a value like the empty interface, um, and then when you want to store something, you basically call a function and at this index, at this key, you store a struct, an empty struct. This means that when you want to retrieve the value, you have an exist function that basically tells you if uh, the value under your key is taken, if it is nil or not. So if it is nil, then you know the value has not been taken yet and it's not in the map. And this works um, fine, of course, for smaller set-like things until you restart your Go program because it's in memory. Um, and if you want to use this, we can see that you know we store three values here. We have Richard, we store Elsa, we store Richard again. And in the end, when we print the output, there's only two values. So it acts exactly like we would expect a set to act. Every element is unique. And this works fine, but then at some point you start thinking of scaling. What happens if your set has a thousand users or a million or a billion users? Well, memory is finite, so at some point you're going to use too much memory. And there's a few ways of solving this problem. The first way of solving this is by just throwing more money at it. So nowadays, most of us uh, run on some kind of cloud architecture, whether it is uh, Amazon or provided from Google or whatever. Usually, if you spend more money, you're going to get more computer resources, uh, more memory or more, more CPU cores, whatever. Um, but this might not be the ideal solution. One, because it's going to become pricey really quickly. And two, well, they are also finite in what they offer. Um, I don't think you will exhaust them that quickly, but it's at least theoretically possible that you do so. So another approach is to use a better algorithm. And a better algorithm, I mean, it's, it's not exactly, you know, how do you define a better algorithm? Well, usually when you're developing something, there is this trade-off between memory, so memory complexity and well, space complexity and runtime complexity. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually make a different trade-off. So in probabilistic data structures, you're going to sacrifice, um, so you're basically going to sacrifice your accuracy for getting an algorithm that's going to be faster and use less memory. So the trade-off becomes one of accuracy at this point. So this means that in these type of data structures, you're not always getting an answer that is correct. There is a certain probability that your answer is going to be wrong. But you are going to get actual results. And so this is important because let's say an algorithm normally takes two hours to complete. Well, if you can do it in two minutes by sacrificing your accuracy, that's going to be quite good as long as the accuracy is still decent. So if it's like 95% accurate, depending on your use case, that might be something you want to go for. Um, and as we will see, such structures can be used as a type of like caching layer 
that basically checks your code really quickly. In our case, it checks really quickly if a username is taken. But then we have to find a way to deal with this you know, false positive probability. So we'll get into that later as well. So the first one of these structures that we can use for this is a Bloom filter. And a Bloom filter is a space efficient set like data structure. And that's basically telling us that this is going to act like a set, um, but it's going to use less memory. So it's going to be space efficient. The downside of the Bloom filter then is that it has false positives. So when the Bloom filter tells you your username is taken, it might be lying to you. But if it tells you it is not taken, you are 100% sure that it's not taken, right? So you only get false positives, but you do not get false negatives. And why this is, we will get into with a small example. But first, let's talk about some use cases. So they are actually used quite a bit. Um, for example, in Chrome, if you navigate to a certain URL, Chrome will check your your URL against a block list. So it makes sure that the URL is not malicious. Um, and of course, this needs to happen quite quickly uh, because you don't want the user to wait with loading the web page more than is already necessary. Uh, another thing is the Bigtable lookups. So in Bigtable and one of the Google Cloud, uh, let's say databases, a Bloom filter can be used to eliminate useless searches. So you don't look for something that's definitely absent. And in Medium, it can be used, for example, to avoid duplicate recommendations for articles. So as you see, these, these probabilistic data structures and the Bloom filter in, in, in particular is definitely used um, in the wild and you're definitely interacting with it without even realizing you're interacting with such a structure. So then, if you look at the high level of what a Bloom filter is. So with a Bloom filter, all your data, all your usernames in our case, are going to be stored in a bit field. And each entry only takes up one bit. Maybe a bit more, but uh, in theory, one bit is enough. If the bit is one, then we know the element is present, or well, possibly present. But if a bit is zero, then we know that the username that maps to that bit is definitely going to be absent. So then let's step through this a bit. Let's say that we take the same input as before. So our input is Richard, it's a string. The first thing we're going to need is we're going to need our bit field. So in this case, the bit field looks like a matrix of, of nine values. In reality, it is just going to be a one-dimensional array. And hopefully with more than nine bits, actually. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to hash our value, which gives us a certain number. And then we're going to map the number from the hash function onto our bit field. So that's the modulo nine operator in this case, modulo the bit field size, which returns a seven. And then the element at index seven is set to one. So when we do this, we see indeed that this element is set to one. Um, next, we enter another value, LZ, and we're going to go through the same thing. So we still have our bit field. One element is already taken by Richard. We hash LZ, gives us a number. We map this number onto our bit field again. And then we get index five at this point. So index five is set to one. That happens here. So that is how you would enter something into the bit field. Now to read out from it, it's a very analogous operation. So we take our input, alza in this case, we hash it, it gives us the same number as before. We do modulo the size of our bit field and gives us the index five. But now, instead of writing something to this bit field, we're going to read out the data from it. So we're going to return if it is one or not. If it is one, something is taken. Well, this username is taken. But 
let's say that we want to enter Anna into our bit field. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to hash the value, which gives us a number. And then we're going to do modulo 9 again. And this gives us the same index as before, 5. So recall that this location was already taken by Elsa. So now what happens is that we have a hash collision, well, a collision in the bit field. So we have a duplicate entry at this point. And this is where the probabilistic nature of a, of a Bloom filter comes in. So it is possible that multiple elements correspond to the same location in your bit field. And so there's a few possible causes for this. One is a hash collision, so two usernames in our case, that create the same hash. But something else that's possible is that different hashes still equate to the same location in the bit field. Of course, this depends on the size of your bit field, how often this is going to happen. So there's several solutions for this. Uh, one is to use multiple hashes. When you do this, uh, every element will take up more than just one bit. It will take up multiple bits. So here is a small example of what this looks like from Wikipedia, actually. So we have three elements here, and each element corresponds to three different bits. So if we look at element X, we see that this bit was set to one, but also this bit, and also this one. So for each element that we're going to store, we're actually going to store three different bits. And now if we want to read if W is contained in our Bloom filter or not. So we're, we're first going to check the first bit, which is this one. So it looks like it's taken. Then we check the second one, this one. Again, looks like it's taken. And then we check the third one, which is zero. So it's not taken. So for an element to be contained in the bit field in our Bloom filter, all the bits need to be set to one. So that's one way of avoiding um, this type of collisions that we saw earlier. Another one is to use a hash algorithm with better properties. So it's spread out more evenly, for example. Uh, a few that I came across are Murmur3 and SHA256. So you can experiment with this a bit, but there's actually enough information online about which one to use and also how many to use. And finally, you can use a larger bit field. So this is going to be the trade-off or the main trade-off between your accuracy and your memory usage. The more bits, bits you're going to use, uh, the more accurate you can be. Because of course, in our example, we had nine bits. So everything maps to those nine values and you can't store that many elements. So this is one way of making the accuracy go up while also having more memory usage. This is just a small side note that these things are not really guesswork. So if you want to know the accuracy of your Bloom filter, you can basically use this formula. So E being Erdos constant, K being the number of hash functions, N being the amount of elements that are inserted, and M being the size of the bit field. You can find out what the accuracy is. And likewise, you also don't have to guess of how many hash functions you're going to need. Assuming that you know what bit field size you want and how many elements will be inserted, you can figure out what the um, optimal amount of hash functions is. Just a small side note, if you implement this, it's not uh, guesswork, it's not trial and error. You can just plug it in, in these uh, formulas. So now let's go through the code. So in Go, a bit field would just be a slice of booleans, or a array of 100 booleans in this case. Um, and then to create the hash, it's just a simple hash function. We accept an interface of a hash, so we can use any function that we want. And we get some input. And then this function basically is just going to take the hash value of this, and it's going to return this value. So that's the first step here. So we hash the username, we get back a certain number. The next part 
is going to basically use the modulo operator. Yeah? So this function first gets the hash position, well, the hash number, sorry. And then we do modulo the size of our bit field, that's this step, to get the actual location of the element. Now, once we've done this, the set and get operations are, are quite small. So to set a username, we're first going to find out what the position is of this element, and we're going to set it to true. That corresponds to the one bit that we saw earlier. And to read from our Bloom filter, we're going to first get the position. And then we're going to just say, hey, return the value of the bit field at this position. And this is going to return either true or false, so that's it. We don't have to do another comparison here. So to make this filter a bit more safe, what we can do is using it as a type of cache, as I mentioned earlier. So in this example, what we're doing is we have a frontend, which basically asks the backend, hey, check the filter for a certain username. And the backend in the Bloom filter ideally returns, hey, it's not in there, we don't have this username. So it just sends the response back to the frontend. And now you know that the username is not taken. And this means that no query had to happen. But another thing that could happen is that the frontend asks, hey, can you check this username? And the username is in the Bloom filter. Now what needs to happen is the backend will need to basically ask the database to verify because it could be a false positive. And so this is where the database query happens. And then the database sends the response back to the backend and the backend to the frontend. So by using this Bloom filter as this layer in between, you can avoid doing more expensive queries and basically get a response either really quickly or do a lookup anyway to be 100% sure. So that's one way that you could use a Bloom filter and still always get a correct result. So that was it for the Bloom filter. As you saw, you could probably implement this in about 50 lines of code. It's, it's actually quite an approachable uh, data structure. And there's actually a few extensions on it, uh, like counting Bloom filters and so forth. Um, but another one I want to highlight here is the Cuckoo filter. So the Cuckoo filter has some interesting properties uh, and it's, its algorithm is also just quite interesting in my opinion. But one major difference with the Bloom filter, let's say, is that you can delete things. So in our Bloom filter, you could not delete elements. If you would delete an element, you would basically set a bit to zero, but you don't know how many usernames were mapping to that bit. So you're potentially removing too much data. So this means that you could not delete in a Bloom filter. In a Google filter, however, you can actually do deletions. Uh, it's also easier to implement than some alternative implementations or some extensions on the Bloom filter. In general, it has low space overhead as well. And it has higher performance uh, than even most of the alternatives. Well, I have to be a bit careful with that because I didn't check all of them, but with a lot of alternatives that I've seen, the Cuckoo filter can outperform it when it has 95% utilization. So it needs to have a high level of utilization to be useful. So some terminology that I will be using here, a fingerprint uh, is a unique identifier for a username. It's not the username itself, it's an identifier of it, so it's a fingerprint. And a bucket can be thought of as a bucket in um, a hash map sense, like in, in Java, for example. So where each bucket contains multiple entries and our <clears throat> map has multiple buckets. So in a high level overview, we need to have the input and we need to generate a fingerprint of this. We're going to take two hashes, one of the input, one of the fingerprint, and we're going to make them correspond to two different buckets. If the buckets are full, we're going to start rearranging them. So we're going to rearrange elements to find empty spaces. So this relocation thing is a bit more clear with this image, I think, which is from the uh, paper published in 2014. So it's actually linked at the bottom of the, of the slides. And so what we see here is we want to store an item X, let's say our username. 
and we're going to first find two hashes and each hash corresponds to two locations. In this case, location six and location two. And so the buckets at these locations are full. And that's because the buckets here are of size one. Uh, the buckets could in theory have multiple entries, meaning there would be multiple columns. And each row, each bucket could store multiple values. Now in this case, because um, both the first and second bucket, so number two and six are taken, what we're going to do is, we're going to try to store element X at location six, and we're going to ask element A to move to its alternate location. So each element has an alternate location. So what we're doing with A is we're going to kick it out and its alternate location is four. But this is also taken, this is taken by C. So we do the same thing for C. We move C to its alternate location. So when we do this, we notice that its alternate location is one and it is empty. So now we store C in one. And then the final state is that our new element moved to position six a moved to position 4, and C moved to position 1. And so that's the core of the algorithm. We're going to shuffle elements between buckets to find empty spaces. So in pseudocode, we have our username. We're going to try to store the fingerprint in the first bucket. If it is successful, that's where it ends. If not, we're going to try to store it in the second bucket. If it's successful, that's also where it ends. But if it's not successful, until we have hit our retry limit, so we're going to set a limit of the amount of retries, shuffles that we can do, we will pick a random entry. We will move this random entry to its alternate location. So each element has two locations, right? We're going to try to store it here. And if it is successful, that's where it ends. And we're going to do this until we either have success or our retry limit is hit. So in Go code, we have our struct, which is the cuckoo filter. We have a slice of buckets, so a number of rows in the image that we saw. Uh, and each bucket stores a slice of fingerprints. So that's the um, entries that you're going to get. And a fingerprint is a slice of bytes, basically a string or whatever. It's an identifier that we're using. We're also keeping track of m, the amount of buckets that we have, the entries per bucket, the length of our fingerprint, so we can play with how much data we use to identify our username, and a capacity for our filter. And yeah, these variables are not super descriptive, but they map to the paper that I linked earlier. So if you want to go through the, the source material, then at least the the numbers, sorry, the letters they're using are the same as the one that we're using, so it's easy to follow along. And we're going to use a hash function, I chose SHA1, but could of course go with a different one. So our hash function now became a little bit more complicated with the Bloom filter. So one is going to return three values. It's going to return a hashed number, well, a number value for the hash of our uh, username, the fingerprint, so the hash of the fingerprint and the fingerprint itself. So what we first do is we hash our data. Then we're going to take a subset of this hash to be an identifier, to be our fingerprint. We're going to, the first uint is basically the hash of the data itself, of the username. And the second value is the first value, XORD, with the hash of the fingerprint. And we're going to return all these three things. So when we have gotten them to insert something, first we're going to say, okay, give us the three values. So E1, E2, and F. And then we're going to check what bucket the first number corresponds with by mapping it onto the amount of buckets we have. This is similar to mapping the hash on the bit field in the Bloom filter. So it's a similar operation. And then we're going to ask this bucket, give us the next index, which is a small utility function to give the next three slot. So um, if a bucket has you know, multiple entries, it's going to give the first entry that is nil. When we find this empty value, well, this empty uh, slot in the bucket, we're going to store our fingerprint there. And if this was successful, that's actually where it ends, because now we have entered something in the cuckoo filter. 
If not, we're going to find the second bucket using the second value that the hash function returned and mapping it onto the buckets as well. And then we're going to again ask the index and storing it there if we can. But in case it goes wrong, we need to start shuffling them. So this is where the complexer part comes in. So we're going to iterate until we hit a retry limit. And this retry limit we can play with. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the index that um, our this one initial corresponded with. In this case, it's six. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to take a random entry from this bucket. So this bucket could have more than one entry. And what we're going to do now is we're going to basically swap them. So our fingerprint is inserted into this uh, bucket and a random entry is taken away from the bucket and that fingerprint is now our current fingerprint. So that's this, uh, this line. That's basically a swap of storing in the bucket, taking a random entry out of the bucket. And then this random entry that we took, we're going to find its alternate operation, or its alternate location using this XOR operation. And we're going to find the bucket that its alternate location corresponds to. For this bucket, we're going to ask the next free index. If there is a free index, we can store it, and that's where it ends. If not, again, until our retry limit is hit, we're going to keep doing the same operation. Put a fingerprint in a bucket, take a random entry from the bucket, find its alternate location, and try to store it, and so on and so forth. And in the end, I have a beautiful panic here in case that we can't store it anymore. So once we have this um, algorithm in place, looking up something uh, is actually a relatively lightweight operation. There is no shuffling that needs to happen. So what we're doing is we're going to, for our username called needle here, we're going to basically find the three values again. So the two uh, hashes, as well as the fingerprint. And then we're going to ask, does the first bucket contain our fingerprint or the second? And if so, we return true. So the contains function here is a small convenience function because a bucket can indeed have multiple elements. So we just iterate over all the elements and compare it with our fingerprint. And if our fingerprint is in there, we return true. If not, we return, we return false. But we are also going to return the index that our fingerprint has. And so with this index, we can actually start doing deletions. So a deletion is very similar to the, the lookup, in essence. Because the first thing we're doing is taking the three values of our username, finding the bucket that it corresponds to, checking if our bucket contains the element, and if so, with the index that the contains function return, we're going to set this value to nil. So essentially we're removing it from the bloom field, from the cuckoo field. And then if this was successful, that's where it ends. If not, we do the same thing for the second bucket. So that was a really fast overview of two types of um, probabilistic data structures with the same purpose, with storing data. Uh, there's more, of course, there's the XOR filter, which does something similar. But there's also a whole host of different uh, algorithms and data structures like hyperlog, log, min, hash, and tree. So I couldn't go in depth in all of these, uh, but some of these you can also find on my GitHub. So um, thank you. So if you have more questions, you can actually just tweet them to me at Dylan Mayus, or you can check out the code. So on GitHub or on this link, uh, you will find the code as well as medium blog posts describing the article, describing the data structures as I've just done. And there's also links to the source material in there. So thank you for listening.